So hello and welcome to the video. I recently spent a week on the Norwegian Epic, cruising the Mediterranean from Barcelona to Italy and back again. This was my second cruise on Norwegian and we chose to go back to them after being quite impressed by our experience on the Norwegian Gem a few months earlier. And I had a great time, as I do on every cruise, even if there were a couple of oddities about this cruise and, in particular, about this ship. There were also a couple of firsts for me on this cruise. I've already released a cabin tour video which reveals some of the ship's oddness, and I made a video about what makes Norwegian different after that first cruise with them earlier this year. I will also make a video about the ship itself, and a video about the ports we visited, and I'll link to them here when they're released. Those videos will be primarily factual, but in this video I'll be a little more opinionated as I review the overall cruise experience. So if you'd like to see what I thought, and then stick around. Hi, I'm Matt, and I love cruising. I love the ships, the places you visit, the entertainment, and every now and again I'll also enjoy a drink. So subscribe to see where I go next and perhaps get some inspiration for your next cruise. The first first on this cruise was that I included flights in my booking making this trip a package holiday. Norwegian was running a promotion whereby they'd contribute £250 towards the cost of flights to connect with the cruise. As the flights we wanted priced up at £248 each they were effectively free. We flew with Vueling, sorry, Bwelling, and although it wasn't exactly a luxury experience, it was pleasant enough and they got us to Barcelona on time. I reviewed that flight in this video, which can be found on my Matt's Planet channel, where I cover my non-cruising experiences. After retrieving our baggage, there was a meeting point in the arrivals hall for NCL passengers. A transfer to and from the port was included in the package, which saved us even more money, as taxes would have cost around €40 Euros each way. We didn't have to wait long before a coach full of people had gathered and we were escorted down to the buses and a very pleasant 25 minute drive to the port. I don't usually recommend flying in to meet your crews on the day of departure if the flights aren't part of a package. That's for a couple of reasons. Firstly, you're in serious trouble if the flight is badly delayed or even cancelled and you miss the boat. It's not going to wait for you if you have independent travel arrangements. But perhaps more importantly, you're paying for that first day of the cruise. Unless you get a very early flight, which gets you to the port before boarding starts, your travel is going to eat into that first day, which means you'll be missing out on some of the cruise experience you've paid for. I would always recommend travelling the day before a cruise starts. It might cost you a night in a hotel, but it will de-risk the travel and will maximise your cruise experience. But we didn't hesitate to take a packaged flight on this occasion as it represented such good value, and we knew the ship would wait for us if something went wrong with the flight. We ended up getting to the port around 3pm. That was much later than we would normally have arrived, but it did mean that there were very minimal queues. We dropped our bags and were very quickly checked in. After some previous bad experiences, Mum requested wheelchair assistance, and even though she probably would have coped perfectly well given that there was no queuing, it was quite nice for her to be wheeled aboard. A small welcoming committee of tambourine janglers was a very nice touch. And on to the ship. The Norwegian Epic. No mask. Congratulations. Finally. Yeah. <laughs> when it was built in 2010, it was the third largest ship in the world and had 155,000 tonnes. It certainly is a big one. It has quite an unusual story though, as a sister ship was ordered but was never built as Norwegian ended up in dispute with the shipyard. The Epic has some unusual features and, as I've already hinted, the cabins are very odd and it is quite telling that many of the features of this ship were never repeated in later Norwegian ships built at other shipyards. I'll talk in a lot more detail about the ship in my Day in the Life video, but I'll say here that it's not an attractive looking ship when you look at it from shore. Not that this makes the slightest difference to the crew's experience, but it is very boxy and it's really odd that the lifeboats protrude in such a way. It can carry over 4,000 passengers and was about 85% full on our cruise. It was busy but not uncomfortably so. We were always able to find lounges by the pool and seats in bars when we wanted them. Norwegian's more modern ships are actually a similar size to the Epic and boast some significant attractions like go-kart tracks and 10-storey slides. 
You could see the genesis of that approach on the Epic, as it had some quite serious water slides, which were fun, but it was perhaps a little lacking in attractions compared to more modern ships. There is an area at the front of the ship called Spice H2O, which is an Ibiza-inspired beach club with a pool, bar and restaurant, although it was closed for repairs on our cruise, as was the adjacent sports complex. Really annoying, and they only notified us of this after we'd booked, and as we booked quite close to travel, they probably knew about the closure but chose not to tell us. Anyway, we received a $50 per cabin onboard credit as compensation, but I would have much preferred to have access to those facilities, particularly as Norwegian makes a big deal of the entertainment that is put on in the evenings in that space. Inside the ship, you could clearly see some more bold design decisions at play. Before my first cruise with Norwegian, I'd seen many comments that whilst there were plenty of inside venues, they tended to be small and boxy, and that interior space was quite broken up with limited sight lines and a slightly claustrophobic feel, and that was certainly true of the Epic. Most ships have one or sometimes two secondary performance venues outside of the main theatre. The Epic has three. The headliner's comedy club, no actual comedy was offered on our cruise, but there was a dueling piano show branded as Howl at the Moon, which is a quite well-known entertainment business in the USA. This featured on most nights of the cruise, with other performers filling in on other nights. The venue was small, with poor sight lines and many pillars, which completely blocked the view for some, but its size did allow a good atmosphere to build, particularly during the dueling piano shows. The second was the Spiegel tent, which was a, a kind of tent. Unlike that first venue, it had excellent sight lines, but I never found any event actually taking place in there. It was all quite odd, actually. And the third venue is the Cavern Club, an attempt to recreate the original Cavern Club in Liverpool. Not a particularly successful attempt, but I appreciated the effort that had been made. This was the home of a variety of performers, including the ship's Beatles tribute act, who were outstanding. I've seen a few over the years, and the epic Beatles were really good, even if they lost some authenticity versus other groups from having a right-handed Paul McCartney. The problem was that the venue had a capacity for perhaps 200, but the Beatles were so good that probably 2,000 of the passengers wanted to see them. If you hadn't camped in the venue some time before showtime, you just couldn't get in which was disappointing as the band was an absolute highlight, but at least they offered a main theatre show which many more people could enjoy. Having three secondary performance venues was great and does differentiate the epic, but all three were flawed to quite a degree, which impacted on your ability to actually enjoy them. The main theatre was quite large, although the entertainment offered was, well, it wasn't great, even if Norwegian made a real big deal of it. On the seven nights of our cruise, we enjoyed the Epic Beatles plus two guest performers, a violin flamenco duo called Duo Essentias, who were pretty good, plus a comedy magician called Ben Woodward, who was excellent. There were also two licensed stage shows, both of which were offered twice, so there were only five different shows offered on a seven-night cruise. The licensed shows were obviously costly to put on, which probably explained the repetition, but I have to mark Norwegian down for effectively only offering five nights of entertainment in the main theatre. The first licensed show was Burn the Floor, a dance spectacular, which was certainly spectacular, even if it wasn't entirely my cup of tea. The second was Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. Hmm, this is tricky. Let's just say that the film on which the musical is based is now 26 years old and the show felt incredibly dated. Given how gay acceptance has moved on over those 26 years, the stereotypes portrayed just felt horribly outdated. I've never attended a show, on land or at sea, where more people have walked out mid-show, including me. So all in all, I was quite disappointed with the entertainment offered in the main theatre. Returning briefly to the ship, and there were some design elements away from the entertainment venues that I also didn't love. 
The layout feels a bit disjointed and haphazard and doesn't really flow. There is a central focal point, but having been on other ships this size or bigger, the opportunity to create something quite spectacular was missed. It's also the only ship I've ever been on to offer an escalator between decks. Norwegian promotes its freestyle cruising strategy, which is intended to offer a more relaxed cruising experience. We enjoyed the philosophy on the Norwegian gem, and it was a large part of the reason why we chose to return to Norwegian. When it comes to dining, you don't need to make reservations and you can show up where you like, when you like. You may need to wait a bit for a seat at busy times and the ship was fairly full, so we did see this happening, but we tended to dine a little earlier than average and had no issues being seated when we wanted. We had two main dining rooms to choose from, the same menu in both, but you could mix up the decor. I thought the food was good, not always overwhelming in its ambition, but it was very well executed with good portion sizes. And in the Manhattan Room, you were entertained by a jazz band while eating, and we even had a performance from the cast of Burn the Floor one evening. Our package included two nights of speciality dining, and we went for the French restaurant, which was excellent, and the Cagney's Steakhouse, which wasn't. There's no open flames on a ship, so it's hard to cook a steak well. Some ships manage it, but I'm afraid the Epic didn't. Our deal also included the beverage package, which covered perhaps 90% of the booze options aboard and was generally excellent. The wine choice could have benefited from being a little broader, but we found good options with our dinner, with just a little experimentation. Another first to me on this cruise was that there were multiple boarding points. We boarded in Barcelona, but you could also cruise from Civita Vecchia, and I think Rome's port was slightly more popular. It doesn't impact on your cruise to any great degree, but it was a little odd for people to be at different stages of their cruise. When everyone is synchronised, the first and last nights of the cruise can be turned into real events, but that wasn't really possible on this cruise. I'll review the ports in detail in a separate video, but one of the attractions of this particular cruise was that it visited a port every day. When you're given the chance to visit Ajaccio, Parma, Cannes, Naples, Florence and Rome on the one cruise, you know it's going to be a good week. Even when you aren't keen on a specific port, the slog up to Rome doesn't appeal and Civita Vecchia isn't a particularly exciting town to visit, staying on board is a great option as the passenger load really thins out and it's fun to spend a relaxing few hours by the pool when it's quiet. Long time viewers will know I'm not a huge fan of all things Italian, but I will put on record that I thought Naples was great. And I'm thrilled that any reference I need to make to the health requirements comes now at the end of the video, rather than being so significant it needs to come first. On this cruise, which we took in September 2022, you needed to be double vaxxed or to have had a recent negative test to board. No masks were mandated aboard, and this was the first cruise I'd been on since the restart when the crew weren't required to wear masks. A quick word on disembarking, which was a bit of a shambles. Instead of lining cases up by tag number, as happens on every other port I've ever transited, cases were circulated on belts with no obvious guidance as to which tag numbers were being delivered, which was somewhat chaotic and is probably more the port's issue than Norwegian's. And the process of getting our transfer bus to the airport was also poor. Perhaps a dozen people had passengers' names listed in six-point font on sheets of paper, and they had to find your name amongst the masses in the dark before you could board the bus. Unless, like some people, you didn't realise there even was a system and just boarded the bus anyway. It was all a bit of a shambles. So I had a great time on this cruise. I linger on shortcomings when making these videos, so you can be aware of what might be a challenge for you if you are considering something similar. But there were plenty of things to commend this cruise, although the Epic is a very peculiar ship. I think it is telling that there are a lot of features on this ship that just haven't been repeated. Nevertheless, I still really liked the Norwegian freestyle approach and remain very keen to travel on one of their newest ships to see how that strategy is delivered on a ship that reflects their very latest design philosophies. I paid a whisker under £1,700 for seven nights in a balcony cabin, including flights and transfers. That fare also included Norwegian's free at sea package, which included a drinks package, a decent chunk of decent internet time, two speciality dining meals and $50 off an excursion in each of the six ports we visited. Plus we had that $50 of onboard spending from the H2O venue being closed. 
Not the cheapest price I've ever paid for a week's holiday, but I still think that's pretty good value as we literally spent nothing else all week. So thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed it. Please give this video a like if you did. Hey, give the video a like if you didn't enjoy it but have still made it this far through. Please subscribe if you're new. Lots more stuff like this on the channel with plenty more coming. And please leave a comment. Have you travelled on the Norwegian Epic? Am I right that it is one of the weirdest chips out there? And if you'd like to support what I'm doing more directly, I have a Patreon account, the link to which is in the description below. So thanks again for watching and I'll see you all in the next one. Goodbye.